Well, let me first start by thanking you, Lord Provost, and the City of Edinburgh for this uh, very, very distinguished um, honor. And it honestly is, it's humbling to join. I looked, of course, to everyone else who, uh, who preceded me since 1989. And it's uh, such an honor to join that very distinguished list of honorees. Thank you very much. Um, and Cabinet Secretary, um, I thought it was only Latin Americans who were exuberant. <laughs> Thank you for that overly generous introduction. Uh, you, you are now an honorary Latin American woman. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening and uh, and thank you, thank you very much for coming today. I was noticing as uh, the Lord Provost and the Cabinet Secretary came up here, that all three speakers today are actually speaking from an iPad. Um, and I remembered that uh, quite a few years ago, I had the honor of interviewing Steve Jobs, the late Steve Jobs, during a time in which I was still taking notes on little pieces of paper uh, and then stapling them you know, together after I had finished with them, but certainly not before, because that would have been too organized. And so we were both on the stage, and he sits down, and I sit here, and I have all my little notes on little pieces of paper. Uh, and he looks at me with, you know, total disbelief at my papers in front of me. And he just whispers, I am assuming, hoping that the microphone was not on, have you ever heard of an iPad? <laughs> and I said, I'm so sorry, but I'm so attached to my little pieces of paper. I, don't, I would not know what to do without them. And from nowhere, from nowhere, a gust of wind comes in and all my little pieces of paper. <laughs> and then he took his microphone and he said, and you were saying? <laughs> so um, I quickly moved to an iPad, but I see that, uh, that we've all graduated. Uh, to a more practical and more environmentally friendly way of, uh, of addressing. So how, how wonderful to be in good company. Steve would be proud of all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, we are uh, gathered here today at uh, what is undoubtedly uh, a momentous crossroads in human history. It is actually no exaggeration to say that what we do and what we decide and how we behave over the next two to 10 years will decide the quality of life on this planet for the next 100 years at least. I see some young people in the audience. I see Finley, 11-year-old Finley. Um, and I see people of my generation as well. And it strikes me that we're actually bookending this momentous uh, decision that we're making because my generation was the first generation that developed the scientific understanding. So good on us because my parents' generation did not have that. We developed the scientific understanding to really go into excruciating and painful granular understanding of the climate science. We have developed some of the most important technologies, my generation. We have amassed, perhaps unwillingly, uh, but we have amassed the financial resources since uh, 2008. Uh, we have amassed financial resources that are sitting there waiting for a good cause to be deployed. Um, and I would say we have started with the Paris Agreement, the Kyoto Protocol, and the convention before that. We have started to chart a course to address climate change. Started being the operative word in that, uh, because we certainly have not done what my generation is here to do, the responsibility that my generation still carries. And the reason why I say that we're bookending this moment is because the young generation, and I would like to say those of you in your 20s and 30s, let alone Finley's generation, 
uh, you are going to be the first generation that will actually feel the full impacts of climate change, which my generation will not experience. The full impacts of climate change are those that we frankly cannot even imagine. But the young people alive today will experience those full impacts in every single country around the world. Hence, it is very understandable, very understandable, that we have outrage on the streets, that we have 1.5 million students, including Finley here from Scotland, 11 years old, 1.5 million students out on the streets on March 15th, and it'll only get better. Uh, on that day, 1,300 strikes, 98 countries, really calling us to account very, very clearly. Walking out of school, going to the streets with a very clear call, you adults have not done your homework. You have not done your homework. Or as my friend Paul Dickinson here would say, the long crisis of negligence that we have on our shoulders. I was therefore quite happy to know, Lord Provost, that the city of Edinburgh uh, came out and said that uh, the city would not reprimand the students for their truancy. Uh, thank you for that. And I was uh, quite happy to read that Nicola Sturgeon had called the student strikes a cause for optimism in an often dark world. How refreshing. Not exactly what we heard from 10 Downing Street. So um, why is there outrage on the streets? Well, because we've been at this for decades. That is why. Uh, but I also said we're beginning to address climate change late because I'm the first one to say the Paris Agreement is 20 or 30 years too late. We finally got there. Would delay. Um, but where are we today in trying to address climate change? Well, let me put it this way, quite simply. Five years ago, the world was still headed for at least four to five degrees of temperature rise, which would have made the world completely uninhabitable. Then we had the Paris Agreement, four years ago, adopted, and the Paris Agreement set a different range. The Paris Agreement said, we will not, we, we, the countries of the world, 195 countries of the world, unanimously, have you ever tried to get a unanimous decision even out of your own family? Unanimously agree uh, that we will not allow the temperature to rise um, to any more than the range that is set between 1.5 and well below two. And that is the politically possible um, agreement that was, that was forged in Paris between many different uh, viewpoints as to what the ultimate destination had to be. So that's the way we lived with it in Paris. And then thank you to the international panel, on, uh, the intergovernmental panel on climate change, heeding a call from the Paris Agreement itself took them three years, but they did a brilliant job. And they came out last October with the report on the 1.5 degrees, which really, for the first time, unpacks what is the difference in the world that we will live if we go to a world of 1.5 or we allow it to go to almost two degrees. Uh, I'm sure you've all memorized the 300-page report, but I will give you a little summary. The difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees, which may sound like only half a degree, for which we don't even put on or take off another layer, but as an average global temperature, half a degree represents two completely different worlds. The difference between those two worlds is we would have, if we go to 2 degrees, two to three times as much loss of biodiversity in a 2 degree versus a 1.5 two to three times as much destruction of infrastructure, two to three times as many people exposed to life-threatening heat 
and or hunger. Is it any surprise then that we have outrage on the streets? In fact, may I ask, do we not also have outrage in our hearts? Because that is an unacceptable future for those alive today, let alone for those who are still coming. Is it not outrageous that last year we still increased 1.7% of greenhouse gases instead of having that number be the descent? That is outrageous. Outrageous. And we have to face the fact that we have and we harbor outrage. The only ceiling that we can accept today with the knowledge that we have for temperature rise is 1.5. So as I want to say, anyone, corporation, city, province, country, whoever, if you have already set your climate, straight, uh, your climate change strategy and that is a two degree destination as most people did after Paris and thank you for that effort, However, search and replace. Two degrees is out. There is no way that we can go beyond 1.5. So where are we in that very difficult task? Well, to be, to be humble, I would say we're in a very messy transition. A very messy transition because it's not very easy to tell are we moving forward or are we moving back because if you look for evidence of how we're moving forward you will find it if you look at evidence of how we're not moving forward in fact moving back you will also find it definition of messy and definition of a transition all of them are like that however to make a little bit sense of that I think we could conceive that we're in what I would call a bifurcated reality and the bifurcated reality bifurcates itself between the international political reality that we all read in the newspapers, if we're not reading about the B thing, um, and the uh, real economy. So when we are reading about international political situation, of course, the first thing that comes to mind is what is happening in the dark house, which is my name for a white house where all the lights are out on every subject. Um, but it is really very sad that there is a country the size of the United States that is being led by people who would have a very hard time believing in gravity or, <laughs> or believing that the earth is round. S science is not a myth. It's not a religion. Um, it's science. And either you understand science or you choose not to, but it's not a question of belief. So climate change, gravity, the roundness of the, of the earth, they're all scientific facts, and either you believe them, uh, and either you understand them because they are true, um, or you choose not to. So it is sad that uh, that country has that leadership. However, as we know, there are many cities, gratefully, and uh, states, and certainly corporations that are moving forward despite the darkness of the house. But then you have other countries, Australia, that was also tempted to waver. And uh, from what we see, the next election in May is going to bring sanity back to Australia, which is to be celebrated. But you do have countries like Brazil, and as of late, in fact, as of six hours ago, Indonesia, sort of putting out very disturbing, uh, very disturbing political messages uh, with, with consequences that I believe they do not even understand. But that is the international political uh, situation that we're in. With much less press attention, but with much more importance and impact on what we're doing on climate change is what I would call the real economy. So let's delve into that. In the real economy, I put it to you that we're having a competition between two exponential curves. One exponential curve is sadly the exponentially growing impacts of climate change with increasing intensity and frequency of extreme weather events in all countries of the world. That is going on an exponential basis as scientists predicted. 
The other exponential curve is actually the exponential curve of the solution space. So we have two curves, the damage space or the destruction space, the solution space, and they're both racing. And it is for us to decide which one is actually going to win. So where are we on the solution space on reductions of emissions? Well, let me start with coal because there is no doubt that coal is the dirtiest, most polluting fuel in the history of humankind. There's no doubt. Uh, it also happens to be now, it wasn't 100 years ago, 150 years ago, but now we understand that coal is the greatest threat to the safety and the stability of the planet, and we know that it is actually one of the greatest threats to human health, as we still have seven million people dying every day because of air pollution, not exclusively from coal, but predominantly. Well, gratefully, gratefully, coal, the coal industry as a whole, is actually losing its economic competitiveness because renewables are becoming so much cheaper and so much easier to install. Coal is losing its social license because we now have a NIMBY attitude toward coal, not in my backyard, because we have understood that if it's in your backyard, you're not allowed out to breathe, and it's a little bit difficult to only breathe when you're inside the house. Um, and because of all of those reasons, we're beginning to see an accelerated retirement of coal plants, such as in many countries of Europe, we're beginning to see total voluntary phase out, such as in Chile, uh, and total regulatory phase out, such as in Spain. We're beginning to see the decline in global demand of coal, and the next phase will be the decline in construction of plants as we are seeing in China and India, surprisingly. Um, and we're even seeing the canceling of operating coal mines as we're seeing in Australia. And finally, just recently, we're seeing shareholders taking their responsibility and forcing Glencore to use an example, the largest coal company in the world, to no longer open any more coal mines. Next thing is going to be for them to close their coal plants. But we take it one step at a time. That just because of the social and economic license that the coal industry has actually now lost. But if we move over to the financial world that is also taking note of that, then you see a growing number of insurance and reinsurance companies, including Zurich, uh, SCORE, Swiss Re, certainly Allianz and AXA, that have actually said we are no longer insuring coal. Not because it's immoral to do so, but because it actually is too risky. And if you think of which industry are the risk gurus of the world, it is the insurance industry. So if they have decided that it is too risky to insure coal, I think we can believe them. And of course, financing for coal is also being, uh, being pulled back with first the World Bank, then all of the other regional development banks, all of them without an exception, and now a long list of private banks that are actually pulling uh, their finance and no longer uh, financing coal, including, including the China State Investment Corporation, just announced three days ago that they are no longer going to invest in coal or finance coal, um, either nationally or internationally, which is what they were doing. So, good news, yes, we still have coal, yes, there still is what I would call a fat head, because it is a legacy technology, but that fat head and its long tail that is attendant to the fat head, that long tail, because of the exponential demise of coal, that long tail is getting shorter. Oil. Well, not all the oil that is produced is used by the transport sector, but a great part of it is. So what's happening to oil? Well, consider that Tesla was founded in 2013, and in April of 2017, Tesla, a four-year-old company at that point, surpassed General Motors in market value, a company of over 100 years. Not bad for disruption. Uh, 
Tesla has been having problems, of course, since then, but it still remains a much more interesting investment than General Motors. And the interesting thing is that after they surpassed General Motors, in a space of six months, you had a fantastic domino effect of all of these car manufacturers that announced they're going electric. So Volvo is now 100% electric. You cannot buy a new Volvo that is not electric. In fact, you cannot buy a new car in Norway that is not electric. But they were followed by Jaguar, Land Rover, BMW, Mercedes-Benz, Volkswagen, of course, what else were they going to do? Um, General Motors, Ford, Fiat, and the list is long. Uh, and all of them have actually said, we're moving over to electric models over the next five to 10 years, either some of their models or all of their models, but the direction is very clear and the pull of technology is very, very clear. And if you do not believe that, please take note that Harley Davidson is putting out its first electric motorbike in August of this year, so in just in a few months. They're already sold out, I'm sorry, but you can put yourself on the list. Um, and that motorbike is going to go from zero to 60 in three seconds, try to beat that. It will have 160 mile range just with one charge, um, and you will be able to operate it and follow all of the operation of the electric motor, of course, from your Harley Davidson app on your phone. And the best part about that Harley-Davidson motorcycle is it's gonna be silent. So now, conceive of the change in norm that we are about to embark in when Harley-Davidson motorcycles become silent. I thought that's what they were popular for, precisely for not being silent, right? A world turned on its head, and that is a good thing. And of course, we have so many different countries and cities, including this wonderful country that has actually regulated and put a date when all new sales of vehicles will have to be electric. Norway already implemented this year. Then comes France, the UK, Scotland, uh, the Netherlands, um, and the list goes on and on, but you will be surprised to know, India. India has decided that by 2030, all of the sales of their new vehicles will be electric. Please understand that 80% of all vehicles in India are two-wheelers. So they're gonna move all of their motorbikes over to electric motorbikes. In fact, the Minister of Energy announced just a few days ago that he thinks they can do that over the next three years. And China is currently considering the date in which they are going to ban the internal combustion engine as the motor of, uh, of, of new vehicles. And when that happens, my friends, we will build the museum to the internal combustion engine and you're all invited. It is fantastic what is happening in the uh, transport sector, and in fact, it's not just the electrification, right? You can understand that that electrification is actually going exponential in its impact of the disruption of that sector because it is coming at the same time as the shared vehicle capacity, as the driverless capacity, and all of the smart technology that is being loaded into these vehicles. So all of that technology coming together at the same time is actually the most disruptive force that has ever happened to transport. And yes, there is a fat head because we still will have all of these legacy cars on the road or vehicles on the road. And yes, there is a long tail, but that long tail is also getting thinner. So we're moving. We're moving slower than we should, but we're moving. Now, renewable energy. Uh, did you know that we had, uh, just 10 years ago, we had 4% of the entire electric grid on the world was uh, renewables, and today we already have 23. 23% of all the electricity being produced in the world is coming from renewable energy. That means, actually, that we are doubling the pace of installing uh, renewable energy and energy capacity every four years. Definition for exponential um, and we are very, very well set to be at 50% of all the electricity generated by 2030 is going to be, uh, is going to be renewables. So, not bad. Uh, of course, this is being done because the cost is coming down. The 
cost of fossil fuels, I will remind you, is completely unpredictable. The cost of, uh, of renewable technology, because the renewable fuel has zero cost. Have you ever seen a bill from the sun, a bin from the wind? They don't tend to bill us. But the cost of the technology is also coming down to the point that we're now um, at record, record prices in India, Peru, Mexico, Emirates, Morocco, Chile, China, et cetera. So a whole host of unlikely countries that are actually moving very aggressively into renewables because it's competitive. Um, to the point that China has already met and exceeded its Paris Agreement solar targets. Met and exceeded. Because the press does not report that. They report exactly the opposite. China has met and exceeded its solar targets under the Paris Agreement and India that promised that they were going to be at 40% renewable energy on their grid by 2030 has gone so aggressively into solar because it is so much cheaper than coal in India that India can actually now go not to 40 but to 60% and not 2030 but 2027 2027. So we are definitely on an exponential curve in developed countries as well as in developing countries. Yes. There is a legacy of coal, oil, and gas in our energy system. Yes, it's definitely still there. But all the incremental electricity that is going to be put on the grid by 2021 will be renewable. How is that for an impressive exponential curve? Now, why is all of that happening? All of that is happening because of powerful drivers of change. Technology we've discussed, price coming down we've discussed, policy frameworks of governments and cities we've discussed, finance being moved over from one set of problems to the solutions. But that's all coming at the head and being, being um, maximized by the digitalization and artificial intelligence that we're also bringing onto the market at the same time. So get ready for an energy revolution like you have never seen. The good news about all of that is that we now understand that addressing climate change, decarbonizing the global economy is not a burden. It is actually the greatest opportunity that we've ever, ever had. We have the potential, and we have to because we don't have an option, but fortunately it's a good thing to build a better world, to build cities that are much greener, to build to have much cleaner air and less people dying of pollution, to have energy independence, to have, be much more efficient with our energy. Honestly, it is a very fantastic world that we can build where even this, these buildings will be able to produce all their own energy and stop this outmoded sending of electricity from a power plant over to buildings. Energy positive buildings, energy posit positive homes, that is the future and not very far away. So, if we understand that that is the future that we're building, if we understand that actually, if we uncouple ourselves from what we thought in the last century, those of us who were born in the last century, and we understand that in the face of a very possible economic downturn right now, we actually have the best mega investment project in the world and in history, which is decarbonizing the entire global economy. It is in fact the growth story of the 21st century. It will produce $26 trillion in extra economic growth and create 65 million jobs, which for young people who are worried that computers are going to take their jobs away, 65 million jobs is actually good news. So in the face of economic downturn, the economic stimulus that actually brings us into the 21st century. So where does Scotland stand in all of this? Well, congratulations, and I spoke to several of you uh, a little while ago and said, you don't know how lucky you are to have been born and work and live in this country. Because at first, you live in a country that has already cut down your emissions by half from where you were of the base year 1990. You had in 2009, you had uh, the Scottish Climate Act, which committed Scotland to reducing 80% of emissions by 2050, and as the cabinet secretary has already informed us, they're having the next climate bill that is going to come out saying actually 90% by 2050, with annual targets uh, before that, and 
interestingly, keeping the zero net target, which is what is in the Paris Agreement and has been confirmed by the IPCC, zero net by 2050, having that long-term target under review, such that as soon as there's visibility and how to get there, that will also become legally binding in Scotland. I have a little surprise for you. You will hit that before 2050 because the technology is so exponential and takes on such a life of its own that what seems difficult today is going to actually outpace everything and you will be able to get there before 2050. So do you really need to have full visibility or can you actually go the whole way? The uh, UK uh, Committee on uh, Climate Change said that Scotland's um, aspiration of even 90% by 2050 was, I quote, the limit of feasibility. <laughs> okay. I would uh, suggest that if you ask the Scottish people whether that actually can be done, the only answer you will get is, I, we can. <laughs> so, can we go to 100% sooner rather than later? Now, I will admit it's not easy because Scotland has said we want to do this without offset, offsetting, which is very courageous. But I also will remind you that Scotland, with these natural resources that you have, with the academic stand, standing and expertise that you have, with the engineering depth that you have, with the public awareness so privileged that you are, compare yourselves to the United States, um, with the very hard-working and uh, roll-up-your-sleeves mentality in this wonderful country, and certainly with the political leadership that you have, uh, because they understand that Scotland needs to compete in a decarbonized world, and you don't want to be in the back, you want to be in the front. Well, if you consider all of that, then, um, then I would say there is a small spelling mistake because when many people uh, think about Scottish uh, nature, they say well, it's doer, which is D-O-U-R. I would say there's a spelling mistake there. Can we correct it? It's D-O-E-R. Scottish people are doers. That is your national trait. And with that, my friends, can I invite you also to be stubborn optimists? And let me explain what I mean. For me, optimism is not the result of having achieved something, it is the input that we bring, the decided and deliberate choice that we make to work and live and stand in the conviction that we have together, we have everything that it takes to meet any challenge, starting with climate change, but not finishing there, because believe you me, we will have many other challenges in the 21st century. But if we are optimists by choice, if we know that we have everything, think of how many challenges you have started where you say, I would like to do this by three, or three years from now, but I don't think I can. I guarantee you won't do it. But if we say we want to do this, we know we have to do this, and we, will, we have everything we, we, we need, and whatever else we need, we're going to look for it because we are the adults at the table right now. There is intergenerational justice here. There's no way that we cannot do this job and hand the problem over to Finley and his friends. No way. We have to set this straight before we turn over the baton to the next uh, generation. And that is what I call optimism. And I call it stubborn optimism because we know that there are gonna be many challenges on the road. We know that it's not gonna be easy. We know that there are always, always barriers and hiccups that some we expected and some we didn't. That doesn't mean that we stop. That means that we become even more relentless, even more stubborn about ensuring that we move forward and that we do the thing that is right, but also the thing that is gonna create a better world. All of, the, all of the imperatives stack up. The moral imperative, the economic imperative, the financial imperative, the health imperative, the technology imperative, they all stack up for us. This is an opportunity waiting to be unleashed. So my dear Scotland, 
Let's all be doers and just get this done.